Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the third digital event in the series Transforming Relationships, hosted by the CMI East Midlands and Eastern Regional Board. My name is Mel, and I'm an event delivery coordinator at CMI, and I'll shortly be handing over to Mark to begin today's session. If you have any questions during the event, you can ask them using the live chat box on the right of your screen, and we shall answer as many as we can during the Q&A. Today's session is being recorded, and it will be shared with you tomorrow for those who are booked to attend. And the recording will also be available on the CMI website and CMI YouTube channel. Now over to Mark Hayhurst, events lead of the CMI East Midlands and Eastern Regional Board. Thanks, Mel. Uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome to the East Midlands and East Regional Board CMI event, uh, looking at transformation relati relationships and the series that we're delivering. As you know, we've delivered uh, several so far and there's a series, and the aim of the event is to increase awareness of how to engender trust in you, with your work colleagues and wider teams, as well as focusing on your well-being and how that could become an advantage in 2022. This event will drill down into the well-being aspects of how the COVID-19 pandemic has affected us as individuals as well as teams. As we are all well aware, throughout the pandemic, people's mental health has been affected, which has had an impact on team coherence and their dynamic. Our guest speakers will highlight areas that we all can relate to and find key issues which can be reflected on and used to your advantage in the future. We are privileged and have the pleasure to have two eminent ladies who are experienced leaders, managers, and leading academics in their fields. Helen Helliwell is a Director of Armed Forces People Policy for the Ministry of Defence. Helen is a career civil servant who joined the Ministry of Defence in 2001. She's held roles in finance, policy, strategy, programme management, HR and operations across defence, the Ministry of Justice and the Department for International Development. Nicola Fear is a professor of epidemiology at the King Centre for Military Health Research. Nicola Fear holds a chair in epidemiology at the Academic Department of Military Mental Health and is director of King's Centre for Military Health Research at King's College London. Thank you both for joining this event today. Good evening, Helen. Good evening, Nicola. Helen, we'd like to say hello to everybody. Hi, Mark. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me today, Mark. And um, thanks, everybody, for joining the call and uh, sharing your time with us. I really look forward to what I hope is really informative and um, engaging event with you all this evening. Thank you, Helen. Nicola. Thank you, Mark, and thank you for that uh, great introduction and, and welcome. Um, and hello to everyone on the call uh, this evening. Um, as Mark said, I'm a professor of epidemiology and thanks to COVID, I no longer have to explain uh, what epidemiology is, but just to say I am not an infectious disease epidemiologist. Um, most of my work has been occupationally focused and it will be, um, hopefully I can talk through some of the research evidence um, that I've been involved in. Um, this evening, along with my experience of um, leading a, a, a team at King's College London. So thank you. Great stuff. Thanks, Helen. Thanks, Nicola. OK, without further delay, let's move into the discussion of the event. And over the coming 20 minutes to 30 minutes, we've got some fantastic questions. Some also questions that have come in from the members. And also, hopefully, we'll get some live questions coming in later as well. So the first question that we're looking at and I'll direct this at Helen first, is what factors do employers and managers need to consider when trying to build trust and focus on well-being that is essential for an inclusive culture within the new evolving working environment for 2022? Thanks, Mark. Uh, great question. Um, Firstly, I think it's really important to get across to your workforce so that you aren't just interested in their health and well-being so that you can work them harder. It's because health and well-being is fundamental to all aspects of a person's life. And you really want to create that environment which allows everyone to fill their potential in all respects. 
Um, and I think it's also really important to to communicate that health and well-being is much more than just physical and mental health. I'm sure many um, listeners will be familiar with the PERMA model of well-being from Bailey and French around positive emotions, engagement in activities that play to our strengths, relationships that are positive and increase collaboration, just meaning and purpose in our lives, that sense of accomplishment, um, all of those factors uh, are really important to our overall health and well-being. And of course, they're going to be different for every different individual. So we need to respect the diversity of our workforce. Um, an hour away for the, from the desk for a walk or or some, fi- some mindfulness is just as valid as an hour in the gym. So it's really respecting that diversity in your workforce and seeing health and well-being in its broadest sense. So thanks Thanks for that. It's a really good sort of shape. You are shaping this sort of discussion right from the start with lots of really good sort of headlines there. Nicola, um, moving on from that as well, within the same question, how do we looking at introduction of evidence based interventions and how does that fulfill potentially how we look at uh, the forthcoming, you know, 2022? How do you think that's going to develop? Yeah, um, great kind of question and the things to think about. I mean, there are some really useful interventions that are already out there to help and support individuals with their mental health and well-being. I think the kind of one of the key points that I'd like to raise is that there's lots out there that's great, but equally there's lots out there that hasn't got any evidence evidence base to it. Um, and there's always the concern that interventions may do harm uh, as well as good. So I think the importance is if you're looking for something uh, to an intervention to help support your staff with their mental health and well-being, is ensure that uh, anything that you're um, considering is evidence-based. So it's built on a, a, a framework, it's got an underpinning theory, that it's been evaluated and tested, um, and that you know it, it actually does what it says on the tin. Um, unfortunately, there are a number of things out there that perhaps don't do um, what we'd like them to do. So I think it's really important um, that we do make sure that if we are providing these interventions, that they're evidence based. So so leading on from that, then, and I'll stay with you, Nicola, on this is. So what are the what do you think the key ingredients are for well-being to a successful workplace in 2022 or even back end of 21 leading into 2022 and beyond, which may stay? I think, you know, um, leadership is clearly important and not just leadership at that kind of top level, but leadership across all levels of the organisation and with everyone kind of uh, providing the consistent uh, and coherent messages. Um, I think, you know, we also need to think about not just being back in the workplace, but how we get back back to the workplace. Oh, I just heard a bit of how myself then. Um, so I think we need to be thinking about people's uh, travel arrangements. How are they going to get back to work? Mm-hmm. Have they got any anxieties about um, public transport? Could there be? Could we encourage people to avoid coming in at peak hours, etc.? Um, and I think we have to kind of embrace the kind of hybrid way of working. And when I say hybrid, I mean that in um, that we need. Some days we may be working at home and other days in the workplace, but equally we may have some people in the office and other people working from home. So how do we make that kind of new way of working work effectively as we have been able to um, across most things in the current um, remote working climate? So leading on from that, Helen, do you have any any comments against that question? Yeah, so I also think it's, really useful to think about um, work as an activity and not necessarily just always as a place Um, and given the benefits of hybrid working particularly for those who are traditionally in office based workers um, it's having a home environment that's adapted for work a dedicated space particularly for long-term home working making sure that people have got appropriate adaptions desk chairs IT equipment ventilation um, real a real must for those who have differing needs Um, and then I think if we are using the office it's really exploiting that space to be collaborative and to have those relationships with people you know I found sometimes going back into our workplace and main building in in London um, 
because of hybrid working, sometimes everybody's on headsets at their desk. So actually you can feel just as isolated or just as lacking in collaboration because you're on you're on headsets, but from your desk rather than in a in a meeting room because you're not quite sure who's going to be in on the day. So I think planning that a bit in advance, uh, making sure you give when you are in an office environment, you're making time to go and do those desk to desk calls, I think is really important. And just making the uh, the if you're in the office, make it an enjoyable, relaxed space again. So some mm. of those hygienes around, you know, just access to stationery, decent food and, and drinks, etc. I think yeah. it is really important and building in time for those informal discussions and not just meetings. Yeah, thank you for that. That's a really sort of um, in-depth look at many different ways. And I'm going to lead on to, a, to probably a quicker, uh, quicker question just to get through a few more sort of really good um, nuggets of really golden threads for people to to take away is what what ways can we as managers improve life with hybrid and remote teams you've touched on a few there so i'll go straight to, to nicola for a maybe a sort of a an epidemiological view uh, evidence base that you've worked on recently i think kind of touching on some of the points really that we've already raised um i think for me it's about that kind of flexibility so being flexible in how we move forward um, and taking on board other people's needs and considerations i think you know helen touched on this you know making sure your working environment at home is set up appropriately and that you've got access to the right equipment now people are starting to go back into the office is the equipment in the office also accessible does it does it meet their needs have they got the headsets if they need the headsets and also one thing um, that we're thinking about from King's is we've given everyone well most people have now got a laptop yeah. is the expectation that you need to carry that laptop now from home to work and back again and then you know what potentially we're now then, then thinking about well, are there any adverse consequences of that you know from a musculoskeletal perspective so i think you know there, there's lots more for us to learn and think about in this space as as you know as the kind of new normal um comes into existence yeah i think you touch on some good points there the musculoskeletal injuries that potentially could occur with people carrying them around but also loss simple things like loss theft security um implications lots of companies now out there have got their own security um, firewalls, etc. So therefore, you know, they may be putting their own companies at risk. So these are really good, um, interesting points that in the workplace, we don't have those issues because the computer systems were, were, were sedent and they remained in place, whereas now we're transporting them around. So yes, really, really good points. So Helen, have you got anything to add to that? I guess just respect individual differences as well. What won't what works for one won't work for another. We know some people have broadband issues. We know some people don't have space in their home. We know people in shared housing. So maybe working from their bedrooms was really not ideal and just simply not have the space to have a conducive environment. So respecting that and respecting some people will want to come and work in the office environment, I think is really important. Um, where we're all working in one time zone, you know, have those core hours where you can be right. together that enable people to work flexibly before and after those hours to fit in with with broader life um, and also I think um, like I said for hybrid working particularly when uh, people are at home just making time for those informal conversations uh, the conversations that you'd have if you were at the coffee point or the water cooler mm -hmm. or just walking past somebody's desks it's really it sometimes can be too easy just to schedule informal time around meetings or appraisals or discussions where sometimes you just need to be picking up the phone and saying, you know, what's it what's it look like out of your window today? Or, you know, just something really informal where it's not always work, because I think you do miss that um, when you're working from home a little bit. Yeah, I think there's really two fascinating points you brought up there. Firstly, is the is the cost implication. We're now asking people to use their own Wi-Fi. So at what point does the company come in and that's a we'll reimburse you for that or we'll pay that because you're now working a high percentage at home. And the second point is achieving um, uh, discussions, outputs and tasks in the margins. So when you stood by the coffee machine where business sometimes gets mm. gets done and completed and it isn't a formal environment, those are really two good key points of how um, business is slightly uh, going to change over the coming months and years potentially and that moves nicely into into the next question of you know does this future work environment require managed to rethink how we work and how work is carried out with without with a thought to 
how that reimagining that office space is going to look and that the uh, and where the desks are set out and potentially what risks that will will will, will bring up um nicola over to you i think um yeah i mean that whole kind of future working environment and how that's going to look um i think office space um helen's kind of touched on that al already but you know at king's we were tight on office space so we did a lot of hot desk working we're now being advised that really everyone should have their own designated space so that puts pressure on how many people can actually be in the same place at the same time um we obviously need to think about uh, again like you know safe space so if we need to socially distance again have we got the ability to do that in the office ventilation and also making sure that you know we've got appropriate cleaning mechanisms uh in place sort of between the the working day i think we've shown that we can for the vast majority of things work remotely um we've done we did that managed to do that really quickly and really effectively and it's now thinking about well, coming back into that office, how do we make it work um, when we're doing that in a hybrid fashion? So those kind of, you know, tea room conversations that, you know, we just mentioned there, you know, how do you do that when you've got kind of half of your team in the tea room and the other half of the team on the call? Um, how do you have those kind of side conversations in that kind of hybrid environment? Um, which, you know, obviously we need to, to think about that um, as we move forward. So leading on from that, Helen, any comments to add? So I obviously agree with all that Nicholas said. I'd perhaps just add three quick points. Uh, we used to have a culture where, um, you know, it was seen as the right thing to do to come into work if you had a bit of a cough or cold uh, that you could stag on and that you should be present. I think that needs to change and people will be much more nervous around people coughing and sniffing around them. When you've just got a traditional, you know, winter cough cold, I think people will be urged more to stay at home. So I think it's going to change people's psyche around, yes, I'm ill, but I will stag on in. Actually, no, don't stay at home and work from home if you feel well enough to work from home or take sick leave. Um, I think there's something also around uh, remote working where you're where people temp, um, potentially vulnerable people are out of sight. So cameras may be off. You may be talking to them. But what you can't see is their expression. The fact that they I don't know, you know, um, if they wouldn't appear like they are. A, if you could see them, it wouldn't be how they would appear if they were working in the office. So I think you need to be really careful about whether people are really okay or they're just building up that energy to be present for that one hour and then they go collapse on the on the sofa again for a couple of hours. So making sure you've got line of sight on people. And then I think the exploitation we've had in technology. So, you know, who knew that we'd all be better at MS Teams, Skype, Zoom, uh, Google Meets, whatever it is. And that, um, I think we can continue to exploit that in terms of changes in working practices, the online spaces, the online community forums, making sure they're accessible for people with differing needs. Uh, I think work will continue to change in that way, um, particularly, I think, for us in defence, who've had quite a steep learning curve in that respect. I think other companies and sectors were already all over this. And I think for us, it's been quite a steep learning curve. Mm. So it's a huge amount for leader, leaders and managers to consider to make a, a success of hybrid working. So it's not gonna be a quick fix. We've learned over the last 18 months or so uh, by probably failure at the same time, learning by failing of how to improve our hybrid working environment. But clearly now we're gonna to have to step in to have a step change into improving, but not only improving, sustaining that hybrid working environment in the coming months and potentially years if it, if it sticks and we don't regress all the way back to where we were pre-pandemic times. So some really interesting points. So just moving on, so by, by zeroing in on the current COVID-19 pandemic and working practices that we have currently, and hopefully in the future, employers and managers can start to tackle these underlying social and economic challenges that influence overall health and well-being. So what do you think are the main drivers and levers that employers and managers can do to ensure health and well-being is at the forefront of their employment strategy in 2022. Helen, I'll just lean into you first. 
Yeah, I mean, I think this is a really excellent opportunity to create that levelling up that you kind of introduced, led off with. Um, people not having to spend money on higher rents, mortgages, travel, uh, even buying office clothes, actually. We can now, and I have been in my area, recruiting people from all across the UK when traditionally they'd have had to move to London to come and work with us. There's a real opportunity here for, for us to employ a diverse workforce. And then in terms of making health and well-being the forefront of an employment strategy, you've got to talk about it. You've got to champion it. You've got to role model it. You've got to invest time in it. It can't just be a glossy booklet that's put out mm. on coffee tables or online. You've absolutely got to, to live and breathe it and be seen to be doing so from the top down, the bottom up and all the way through the middle as well. So absolutely role modeling and, and living it, I think, to bring it to life. Yeah, really important to bring it to life, to have it that uh, living and breathing that every day um, time. Nicola, have you got any further points to add? I would completely echo what Helen said. And, you know, I kind of when you were asking that question, Mark, I'd written down, you know, leadership and those different layers across all the layers. And I think, you know, talking to the to the to your members of your team, you know, and getting them to reflect on their experiences and, you know, how you can work together to make sure that everyone's health and well-being is um, when needs are addressed. Just as a sidebar question, do you believe that potentially we might be getting to a position where the, the employee then is dictating their work life patterns versus actually the employer, manager and leadership dictating exactly how they work? Helen, what do you think? I think the I think people are now a bit more demanding of their employer than perhaps previously um, and they will want to to stipulate what their what their values are the work life balance yeah. um, sustainability uh, environmental factors are all really important to not just our generation but generations coming through and I think there'll be more of a demanding employee but for all the right reasons and I feel that I think they will have more confidence in saying no I want to work flexibly what is the uh, what mm -hmm. is the company doing about tackling this kind of global issue or you know I, I think people are much more conscious about wanting to work for companies that are interested in that and having a dialogue with their staff about that. Mm. That's a really interesting point and something you said earlier Nicola is you said evidence-based uh, interventions that could support the employees coming back to work or hybrid working with that in mind, um, clearly we've got a lot of anecdotal stories of how um, they would like to approach things. So therefore, how does a manager and leader determine that what the employee is saying is, I would like to do this, this is my strategy of how I'd like my work-life balance to, to be, versus evidence-based, actually that's contraindicative of exactly what evidence-based is. What would you say then in that position as a leader or a manager? I mean, I think it's a conversation. I think you need to have those conversations with your staff about that kind of flexibility, how they would like to work. Um, but yes, you're right. You, you also need to have the, the needs of the organisation and, you know, what the organisation is, is set to deliver to ensure that um, the organisation is delivering. Um, I think we, you know, we all know, and, and it is evidence based that, you know, if your employees are happy and healthy, then you know that's good for them and for their well-being and and their kind of life more generally but it's also good for the organization makes the organization um more effective and i think you know thinking as a society those organizations that are more supportive to their employees are kind of organizations that we as society would probably trust and and respect it's that values-based approach employees are more likely to apply for uh, organizations, companies, business that have that support and infrastructure and that mechanism of support, as opposed to being a bit dictatorial, you will work Monday to Friday, nine to five in this workplace. So therefore that hybrid working, um, as long as it's evidence-based and it's good for all, then it, it's, a, it's a balancing act. And it's probably gonna be very delicate and I can imagine there'll be some very difficult conversations in the coming months with managers and leaders, with their in, employees and their staff to get the correct balance. And it may, it's going to be um, not one size fits all. It's going to be very individual and against those individuals what want specific um, types of contracts. So it's going to get a little bit more complex, I think, in that environment. Yes, absolutely. Um, moving on. So let's take ourselves back a little bit 
to go forwards. Um, what lessons have you learned and what can we take away from the pandemic over the past 18 months that you would do differently in 2022 and beyond? And, and Helen, I'll, I'll, I'll hit you first with that with that question. <laughs> Um, I think we've learned that workforce is going to adapt really, really quickly, actually, particularly when people are behind a common purpose. So COVID was pretty indiscriminate for the working age population about, you know, who it affected. But everybody was affected in some way or other. And I think it just shows the, the power of getting behind something that everybody feel. And it showed that we can adapt really quickly. I also th thought it showed the power of really understanding your teams, um, you know, People are complicated. Uh, there's lots going on in people's lives and really understanding how that can affect their their um, their time in work or how, or how they work. Uh, I think it's really been really important. I think, you know, many of us know more about our teams now than ever before. You know, p people see in, inside everybody's homes, uh, snapshots when we're all on all online etc um but also that people have got really different experiences so um you know for those that were home juggling homeschooling those that had toddlers was really different those that lived on their own those in shared housing it was a really different experience for everybody and just being open about that um really empathetic compassionate leadership just little acts of kindness i think um has been really really important and i really hope that's something that we'll continue through yeah, that, that, that for me of just what you've just said is that acts of kindness is a, is a real key point for me. It resonates massively. It doesn't. It can only be. It could be a two minute discussion with somebody. Uh, it could be that you've gone out of your way to have a discussion um, at a different time than outside a meeting, as you said earlier. Uh, and I think that's it's so valued by individuals and employees and employers as well. And it can be a two way street. So yeah, undoubtedly. Uh, Nicola, do you have anything to add to uh, Helen's comments or your own comments? I think um, thinking back, you know, pre pre March 2020, which does seem like a lifetime ago, I think I would have been very much of the view, or oh, we need to be together to have an effective meeting. And I think this has really shown to me that no, you can have an effective meeting over Teams, Zoom, Google Classroom, or whatever, and it and it does work. Yes, there are some challenges about, you know, perhaps as you've mentioned about how do you get to know people as well and have those kind of sidebar conversations. So I think, you know, um, with our team at King's, we've tried to kind of have really regular, so twice a week, we will have a big team meeting just to touch base. And it's not necessarily about work. It's about, you know, what did you do at the weekend? And, you know, what's happening this week? And to try and have some of that coffee room conversation. I agree, it's, it's not the same, but it, you know, it helps. And, and it, helps to try and pick up people that maybe are falling off the radar a bit that um so you know we, we try and do them at different times um and you know sometimes it's actually maybe we need to just have a, a more of a one-to-one -one with an individual just to to check in with them and i think the other thing um that i would if i was kind of back in march 2020 would be it it um we kind of are very much like oh everyone has a desktop computer you know, only a few people in our team had laptops. And then suddenly I was, you know, buying laptops like they were kind of going out of fashion. And I think, you know, now we're kind of front foot in that. Everyone gets a laptop, everyone gets a headset. So that, you know, if, if we have another kind of lockdown, we're ready, we're prepared, um, that we're not kind of scrabbling around with people trying to join a team meeting on their, their phone, etc. So um, yeah, get get IT kind of sorted right from the from the get go. And I think that's probably one big lesson learned is that business resilience now is built into buying of IT and we're improving. I think a lot of companies are improving over the coming over the recent months and hopefully in the coming months as well, that leads and managers have identified that um, that IT and the infrastructure to support that IT is critical to continue their business successfully. So I think as a leader, as a manager, that's it. That's a probably one of the key strategic enabler that they need to embrace um, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a business or as a company. So absolutely, no, totally agree. So knowing that we're, we're leaning forward into business, do you think that businesses are continually striving to improve their inclusivity of their workforce? So what would you do to ensure that there was greater participation of employees whilst working remotely? Now, we've touched on a couple, but I'm sure, Helen, you've got a couple more points there 
that would be valid to improving that inclusivity? I I think it what well, it certainly has in my area absolutely improved inclusivity. You know, previously we were restricted on meeting attendees by the the, the capacity of the meeting room, whereas now we can get much more many people dining in. I hosted a, an all staff dining call uh, with the PermSec and um, other senior leaders in defence earlier this week. Normally we've been constrained to a 250 capacity uh, conference room. You, you know, we had just under 6,000 people on that call, 6,000 lines, um, and people would have been sat in meeting rooms with others. It's very rare for us to be able to have a live event like that previously, uh, you know, with over 6,000 uh, people on the line so I think that's improved I also quite like the uh, sidebars <laughs> you know when you're on uh, Skype and things people and teams people feel that they can chip in uh, with little comments bullets which perhaps they wouldn't have had the confidence to chip in in the meeting I think also there's lessons with that though about being present for the meeting you're in it's so easy yeah. is it to be on Zoom or be on Skype answering IMs answering the emails looking at Zoom and suddenly you're on three or four platforms at the same time getting hit with messages at the same time so there's something around being present in the meeting that you're in uh, and then just really making sure that we are adapting for those with hearing impediments or sight impediments people that rely on lip reading if the camera's turned off etc so being really inclusive in that way but personally my experience has been that more people are engaging in meetings because they're able to use different bits of the platform where perhaps they wouldn't have had the confidence or felt they could have chipped in before or not even been present in the meeting. Now we're having routinely having meetings with 160, 70 on a call, whereas the meeting previously would have perhaps had 30. Um, mm. So it's a different different way of doing things. Yeah, and that's a, that's a difficult um, potential skill to, to add to everybody's repertoire is that inclusivity piece of, as you as you alluded to, the, the visually impaired and uh, the, the, the deaf Deaf, deaf people that are in your employment um, to, to then how do we adapt and overcome that? So those are definitely definitely interesting areas that we need to tackle as leaders and managers over the coming months. Nicola, have you got any additions to that? I mean, nothing much really to add to what Helen said, but I agree, you know, the kind of, I found that online meetings, in some ways people have become more polite. They put their hand up, they wait to be invited to speak. Whereas we've all been in meetings uh, in person where people just talk over each other and the poor chairperson is trying to kind of unpick what's going on. Whereas, you know, I think we've all found the hands up function and you can't all talk at once because then no one can make sense of anything. So I do think we've become in some aspects more polite. Um, and as Helen said, you know, um, for perhaps some more junior members of the team, being able to put something in the chat function rather than have to say it out loud, I think means that people feel that they can make a, a valid contribution um, to the meeting where perhaps otherwise um, they felt unable to. Yeah, it's a really good, interesting point where you bring in that sidebar information chat where people can put a question in if they don't like speaking and that those people we all know, they're probably in the departments and they sit there in meetings and don't say that, but the, the, the quiet ones are sometimes the ones who have the, the great ideas and are just not potentially confident enough. And that's where, as a leader and manager, you've got to identify with that and hopefully nurture that uh, so you get those good ideas or the contribution to, to the relevant meeting. Absolutely. So knowing that the reevaluation re of work and how we spend our time has also shaped the way we think about our own working and working hours, people want to work less potentially because they've got now these compressed hours or flexible hours so such as a four-day working week nicola what do you what do you see the advantages or even disadvantages of a shorter working week i think to have that kind of flexibility of an additional day for yourself to be able to you know focus on things that you like to do go for a walk or you know you know binge watch a box set you know, that's your time and your choice. I think the challenge is around, is it four day? Is it four days or is it five days in four days? And of course, then you've got the issue of the longer working hours and maybe then that on that fifth day, you're just exhausted from those long days. So you end up kind of doing nothing and, and not making, making the most of that. Um, and I also think it, we need to think about this from a kind of organizational perspective. 
um, because I think it needs you need organizational buy-in to, to make it work otherwise I think it will be oh we'll just send them an email because we know they're around whilst everyone else is at work so I think it's that kind of mindset that this is how it operates and you know we all do a four-day week and you know the days that people are off it varies in the week um, rather than kind of one or two people here and there because I do think it, there's a challenge then with the boundaries um, of making it work. So the potential disadvantage of the boundaries being stretched somewhat by employers as well as em em employees on both sides whether it be a leader a manager or an employee absolutely. Helen have you got any further points to add? I'd, I'd only kind of add that I think it's really important that employees have choice within the bounds of what works for that particular business model. Um, and people need equality of access to that choice. So some people might want to work a four day week. So they're working longer hours during those four days, but that's not going to suit everybody. So those that want to work a standard five day should be, you know, we've had nine day fortnights in for a long time within defense and we've had four day working weeks. And I think you really do need to respect that different people will want to work different patterns, but that everybody should have equality of access to those different patterns as far as possible. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, businesses need to maintain their outputs and outcomes. Um, and that, that has got to be foremost in managers and leaders' minds as well. Um, but to sometimes achieve those, a flexible working with your with your employees is a really productive way of, of doing that. Yeah. And I think um, you brought up a really good point of that quality piece and actually potentially resentment may come into into the into the front of, of, of staff and employees seeing different people with different work balance uh, work contracts and work balance so that's going to be something for managers and leaders to identify with um, and to and to monitor very very closely so the business environment has, has changed a great deal during uh, the, the pandemic and this crisis so much so that return to the plate white plate the workplace might be less urgent than lead leaders think. Helen, how, how would you gauge when return to the workplace makes sense and is appropriate? Um, I think it really depends on on the working environment uh, and where. I mean, you know, this some workers have clearly been win in the workplace throughout the pandemic, and others haven't needed to be so. So I do think it depends on the business, and I do think we need to think about the workplace as the collaborative space, the space for comradeship. Um, and forging those relations, I think it's important to think about the science behind it as well, the double vaccinations, the kind of measures that you can have a place around cleanliness and ventilation and hand washing, all that kind of stuff. Um, and just remember that people have different feelings about it. Some will be really excited to go back to the workplace. When I was in London earlier this week, there's a real buzz on the floor plate, actually, with lots of people in. Uh, but for some, that would be their first time in, actually, whereas for, for many of us, we've been going in a number of days for months now so it's really different for different people and actually people's nervousness wasn't necessarily about being in the office it was about using public transport and tubes particularly being in London to get to the office space so I think it's um respecting all of those different so I don't think there's you could probably pin, pinpoint any one time because some people have been working in the office mm. throughout it's just being cognizant of all those different factors and how different people may be feeling about them yeah and it's it's it... It's quite interesting. We've had a discussion now um, for a good 25 minutes around about office based because we are predominantly office based. But clearly there's a huge workforce out there that's non office based. You know, everybody from a, an architect who has to go out on the ground to a builder, um, to, a, to a farmer, to a landscape gardener. They're all their office is actually out on the ground doing doing their relevant business from there. So clearly there's uh, we may not be very experienced in that area, but there's Definitely. A lot of this is transferable across. Uh, well, into, of, course, into you know, of course, I've got that experience from defence when we, we work whole force, but a lot of our military and the civilians that support them do not work in an office, do not have access to IT, do not have laptops. Uh, you know, they're out on training, training camps, out training fields, they're doing exercises, they're in ammunition depots, uh, you know, working in factories, whatever. So, you know, even within in defence, of course, we've got a real mixed workforce and it's really important to make sure that you're not creating resentment over one particular working pattern over another if, if one is seen to be advantageous over another. So there's, a, there's been some really interesting culture shifts around that, I think, as well. But it's just um, a fact of life that some people's jobs will, are not done in an office. No, uh, we've no. primarily focused on that today. Um, but obviously, working in defence, we've 
we've absolutely experienced that and having to take risk-based decisions all the time on, on what is appropriate for our workforce um, through different phases of the pandemic. Yeah. And Nicola, do you have anything to add to that, what I just brought in there? Well, I, I suppose most of what um, I've been involved in is kind of in some respect office or um, building based. But, you know, from a teaching perspective, we teach um, a lot of uh, undergraduate and postgraduate students. And that's kind of we've had to really change the way that we operate, I, particularly, you know, in the beginning of the lockdown. Um, but now moving in to the start of, you know, it's the start of the academic year with the university, the university students are coming back. Um, and so now we're trying to operate in, a, you know, how do we deliver that teaching in an effective way that ensures that the students feel safe, um, the teachers, lecturers feel safe, um, and some individuals aren't coming back to university, um, students aren't coming back. So how, again, how do we make sure that we're, we're delivering the same level of teaching um, they're getting the same interaction with their course mates, but also um, with with the lecturers. So, yeah, it's um, it's interesting times, and you know we're, we're continually learning and trying to adapt what we do. Yeah, absolutely, and um, that sort of brings us towards the back end of of our discussion, um, wrapping up those questions. And, and it's been absolutely fabulous listening to to your comments. I've got a um, a few. Um, uh, questions that have been submitted in advance from uh, from our CMI members. Um, I've got one here from from Gavin. I'm going to go, come to you first, Nicola. Um, which is, can you measure trust? Ah, oh, great question. <laughs> I think, uh, like a lot of things, trust is subjective, um, and I think it depends on the context uh, in which you're looking at it. Um, you know, do you trust the organisation in which you're based or you're working for? Do you trust your senior leadership? Do you trust your immediate leaders? And do you trust the kind of your team, your colleagues around you? Um, can you measure that? I think, you know, we can all measure that personally about how we feel. Um, I, I don't know as a, you know, I'm ashamed to say as an academic, I don't know of any measures that I can, you know, put in the chat that says this is how you measure trust. But I think, you know, it does depend on, it is subjective and it does depend on which level uh, you're trying to, to get at, you know, organisation level leadership and is that senior or more immediate and is that the, the trust of your or colleagues around you? Mm. Helen, would you like to expand on that at all? No, I, I completely uh, agree with Nicola. It's very subjective, isn't it? Um, I, you know, I don't know if you'd measure it in kind of performance out terms or sickness leave or that, you know, that kind of stuff as well. Um, but it's a very personal thing, isn't it? It's a very personal contract, yeah. either with the organisation or with an individual. And it probably manifests itself in a, in a number of ways. But I think you'd know if trust was broken. Perhaps you might not always appreciate when trust is there. Mm. No, that's a really good point when no, noting when trust has been broken. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've got another question here from from Jodie that was sent in earlier. Uh, so she manages a team of young people ranging from 16 to 18 years old. Do you have any advice on how to motivate this age range, especially with the age difference between um, them and Jodie? Um, I'll come to Nicola first on that one. Oh, well, I could do with some tips on how to make, motivate my 17 year old. So if anyone's got any suggestions, please pass them my way. Um, but I suppose reflecting on teaching and the students that we teach are slightly older, so they'll be 18 and over. Then it's, you know, treating them as equals, um, listening to them, asking them questions in a, you know, in an open way and interested in, in their responses. Um, when I'm talking about my work and teaching them about different aspects of epidemiology, I always try and get across, you know, why I think this is interesting. Um, and I also ask them, you know, what do they want to get out of this relationship? What would be useful for them? And then try and tailor how I build that rela teaching relationship moving forward to ensure that I've got their engagement, you know, from the get go, but also um, throughout the sort of the journey of, of being their um, teacher, lecturer, supervisor. Mm. But if anyone's got any tips, let me know. 
Get them in the chat bar. Nicola would like some tips. Got it. <laughs> I've got another question here um, from Catherine. I'm going to direct this to you, Helen. Uh, that came in earlier. When we focus on well-being in the workplace, do we make employees more demanding or are we merely exposing needs that we weren't aware of before? Yeah, that's a really interesting um question um it's interesting for me i'm the mental health champion for the ministry of defense and when we do um lots of work on mental health awareness uh and mental fitness and reducing the stigma we see more people present potentially to mental health um all gps or to our mental health communities of of health and uh is that because people feel more confident in presenting and talking about it because of the work we've done on reducing stigma or is it because there's a genuine increase in mental health and I think we Nicholas some of the research is kind of out there on which it is actually it's quite hard to tell but um, I think it can only be a good thing that we are having these conversations uh, all of us will have um, a um, continuum of mental health and physical health that will go up and down through our lives uh, through our life um, our life uh, as we respond to different events uh, mm. everyone will have good and poor mental and physical health at some stage I think it's really important to be open about it um, and I don't think that makes employees more demanding necessarily um, but it does mean that we you know have to respect time off for appointments and all that kind of stuff um, just just good management really but if people feel that you're investing and interested in their overall well-being they would normally pay you back in in dividends so i just yeah. think it's really important to be transparent and keep that conversation because it affects everybody mm. yeah i agree certainly with that last to absolutely uh, endorse that um i've got some more um live chats have come in whilst we've been we've been talking over the last um 45 minutes and i've got a a, a live question that's coming from andy here um, and I'll just read it out so everybody gets a, a, an understanding of the question. How should managers manage the conflict arising from the changes allowed for different selections? Admin working from home and manufacturing working on site on shifts. And it's coming on the screen just there from Andy Sutton. It's a great question, Andy, and I don't think there's any one single answer, really. I mean, in some respects, we've always had different workforces within the same company, haven't we? People who've been able to enjoy flexible working, other people who are, you know, not able to be in an office environment. And I can I can see that COVID may have, you know, brought that those polars even further apart, particularly uh, there could be resentment of people not having commuting costs um, and feel like they're saving money. But of course, they've got different utility bill costs at home. But I think it's those open, honest conversations and giving people choices. I don't think there's any magic bullet to it. I don't think it's necessarily new either. I just think that mm -hmm. COVID is perhaps um, polarized it even more and made it even more prevalent um but i don't think it's a new thing and i just think it's one of those around conversations but it's not an easy one because people will feel that a certain bit of the workforce are perhaps getting advantages that others that just aren't open to others because of the way that they work hmm. nicola have you got any points to add to that question no i think just you know kind of endorse what helen has has said you know we do work in well previously worked in a society where yeah some people can work from home and others have to be in the office or on site um so in that sense i think covid has just made us more aware of that difference um but again i think you know respecting each other having open and honest conversations um about how people are feeling with that um and you know talking talking that through with the team members but also with the leadership sure I think I've got I've got time for another two questions. I think I've got one here from from Seema. So I'm going to direct direct this to um, to yourself, Nicola, first. And if Helen, you've got any comments, please jump in. Um, for, it's from Seema. So interested on how to onboard new employees. So how do you bring them on board, build teams, and build culture with a new hybrid working model? Any good examples? I mean, I think. You know, no great examples that I can immediately um, pull out of a hat. Um, we are ex we're just going through this at the moment. We've had new well, we had new members start during COVID, and now kind of we're in that hybrid um, environment. We try and encourage the new team members to come in to the office on on the same day so that they can get to meet each other. 
we can do all the kind of induction with them all together and they can meet the kind of key members of that they're going to be working with and then we kind of immediately try and well, we get them to have kind of one-to-ones with other members of, of the team these are currently all happening online uh, because you know not everyone's back in the workplace but just to kind of try and get them aligned with the kind of team ethos um, make them aware of who everyone is you know who are the important people to go to when you need a new laptop or you know when something's not working uh, but also you know that bringing them into the office so that they can see where they're going to be based where they're going to sit who their office mates are you know where the tea and coffee facilities are so just to you know that making them part of a team right from the from day one um rather than leaving it um for a couple of months so yeah comes back to that inclusivity point that was brought up by helen earlier absolutely helen anything any wider thoughts on that yeah so so i've had quite a lot of turnover on new joiners i've only got a team of about 230 but i've probably had 50 people join through the covid pandemic and actually last week was the first time i'd seen some of them even though they joined over a year ago so we are starting to see people for the first time where you built a relationship on online and now you're seeing them in person for the first time. I think it's really important to do the things that you would do in the office, important to have the one to ones, important to have the team meetings, um, make sure your induction packs are really solid. Um, like Nicholas said, sort out the admin faff. I think it's really important to buddy up with somebody. Um, uh when you're first coming into the building to reduce some of that anxiety around okay they've been around for a year but they haven't actually ever visited the building so perhaps budding up with somebody to come in through um through the front door with particularly in defense where you have all the kind of security and bag searches going in it reduces some of that anxiety um and really making the opportunities for those informal chats uh, with with uh, those staff, particularly as normally you take them out for a drink, uh, you know, take them out for a drink or a cup of tea or something in their yeah. first weeks. And when you haven't been able to do that, just making sure you're doing that in a in an online way where you aren't able to meet physically. But make sure that when they do first come into the office, you make time to ensure that they have a really good experience. Yeah, this, that, that experience is is what people take away, isn't it? That first yeah. impression is that experience of coming to work. Um, if you've had people that for the last year have you've never met, then yeah, that in its own right is a is something to, to potentially fear. And the first time that you know going for that interview, and now actually it's a year later, they've been employed and they've got to go through the whole system again of going face to face. So, absolutely, I've got one more question. I think uh, on the live questions before we wrap up this evening, uh, and it's from Cheryl, and I'll direct this uh, to yourself, Nicola first. Um, she she quickly states, I think balancing those challenges are important. But are the different sec are different sections there for each other when needed? Um, different sections. Um, do we mean like different sections of the organizer? You know, of the could team. Departments. I think it could be departments within the organization. Yeah. Um, yes. I mean, we've. I mean. King's is quite a large university across many departments and many sites. And so even when we were physically able to be in the building or buildings, it was a challenge to kind of get those different parts of the university to coordinate with each other. Um, and, you know, and that has, you know, it has been harder over COVID um, trying to kind of track the right people down um, and then, you know, their availability because of uh, home commitments, homeschooling, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, you know, within our team, we, although we're, we're not as big as Helen's team, but we're about between 30 and 50 people. Um, and, you know, we've got different, you know, admin IT researchers and it has, you know, we've, we've been there to try and support each other. Um, and you know we've had smaller team meetings of the smaller groups and then we bring everyone together and we kind of const you know that clear constant consistent message and that's why we've been having kind of two team meetings a week with the bigger team is just to kind of make sure everyone was on the same page and you know get people to ask questions and to challenge us as 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 the leaders of the unit, you know, what's not working and how can we do it better? And how can we make sure that everyone is there to support each other? Mm. Um, no, absolutely. Helen, you got any final points against that question? 
So I just say, I guess if there's one thing to take away from tonight, that everybody on the call could take away a personal responsibility to make sure that we are there for each other and we are there for different bits of the workforce. If we don't think that's in place, not just as managers and leaders to our teams, but also as managers for each other and leaders to each other as well, because leaders at all levels need support too. And sometimes that can be forgotten when you're concentrating on making sure you're there for these teams. Mm -hmm. Let's make sure that we're there for each other too. And, and I think there's a reverse to that as well. And that followership as well is key to that leader and manager being engaged and, and, it, and it being successful, that relationship, as we spoke about earlier, that trust that we spoke about earlier as well. Absolutely. So just moving on, I think there's three key takeaways for me um, that I've taken away from, from, from the conversation. Is, is one, the first one I'd look at is to encourage a collaboration, engagement and communication is key. It's, the second one would be to invest in IT. We've spoken that, about that several times to improve that inclusivity that Helen, you brought up initially and boost that employee engagement. And that engagement is at all levels, whether it be leader, manager and, and staff. And, and thirdly, I think everyone plays an important role and always consider each other. And I think that's been brought out quite strong throughout the discussion as well, is that there's always a person at the end of that virtual meeting and there's a there's a warm body, for want of a better word, at the end of that telephone call. And Mike, like you said, Helen, you haven't seen some of these for a year, even though they've been employed within your workforce. And now they're introducing themselves. So those for me are those the three key takeaways that I will take. Have you got uh, any differing there? Anything different, Helen? Or are you happy with those? No, really great ones, Mark. Um, for me, compassionate leadership, we've talked about as a theme throughout today and um, collaboration you've, you've already mentioned. And then just remember to take time for yourself to make sure that you are checking with yourself and your own health and well-being. Because if you're not the best version of yourself, then you won't be able to lead and manage your teams to be the best versions of themselves either. It's not selfish. It's absolutely something that you need to be uh, to be able to reach your own potential to. Brilliant. Uh Nicola, do you want to expand on any of those I've said or are you happy with those? You think well, you're just, just really Helen's last point there, you know, what I'd kind of written down here is, you know, things won't always go smoothly um, and we won't get it right first time and we shouldn't beat ourselves up about it. You know, we're, we're all doing our best and we're there to help and support our team and, um, yeah, we need to look after ourselves as well. So no, nothing else to add. Thank you. Brilliant. Well, this, this wraps up our um, East Midlands and East Region um, session uh, on transforming relationships. Uh, I can't thank both Helen and Nicola enough for joining us and sharing their personal insights and professional insights as well into their workforce and, uh, and, and, and the environment they work in, which I'm sure you'll all agree have been both interesting and hugely valuable, and I can't thank you enough. So we'll keep you um, posting on, uh, onto our social media accounts to keep the conversation going, uh, even though we're going to close down in a few minutes. So look for the hashtag Management Transformed, and hopefully you can all share your own experiences and questions too. And I'd like to apologise that if we didn't get to your questions, then please get them into the chat bar, and afterwards we may be able to get back to you. So um, thanks very much, Helen and Nicola, again. It's been absolutely fabulous. I've enjoyed your company, and hopefully everybody else has as well. So thank you again. Thanks very much, Mark. Brilliant. Um, unfortunately, that is it for today's session. Thank you to everyone who joined us. And thank you, Mark, Helen and Nicola for your insights and expertise on the topic, as Mark has mentioned. If you're a member of CMR, you can log into Management Direct using the link in the live chat, where you can find thousands of exclusive practical development resources and much more. And if you're not yet sub subscribed, why not join our community via the link as well in the live chat, where you can gain full access to the Management Direct portal. You can also sign up to the free CMI newsletter. Please also do take a few moments to let us know your thoughts on today's event by completing the evaluation form. The link is in the live chat. So again, thank you everyone who joined us and enjoy the rest of your evening.